So hello, everybody. We're uh, we're here for another episode of Herald on Games, and this episode is going to be um, from the SD HisCon online convention, and the topic is um, is coin. Uh, we're calling it a coin reunion. Uh, some people call it the coin purse. I don't know what that means exactly. Um, but what we have is we have a handful of coin designers that are here or joining us. And we're going to talk about uh, coin and their history with coin and their experience and, uh, and, and the process. So um, I see Brian, uh, Brian Train. Uh, and uh, let's see, I see Morgan guillon Rete. Hello. Uh, Hello. Bruce Mansfield, of course, is, is with us. Uh, so let's see. That's, um, yeah, that's, that's me and three. So I think we'll see more uh, trickle in as we go. I know Mark Herman is trying to find the link. And uh, Volko is closing out the last session that we did on uh, Liberty or Death. With it. I think we had 24 people in that at one point. So um, um, I'm going to start off by talking to the, uh, to the designer, at least amongst the four of us present, uh, that designed first, and that was Brian Train, who did first. You did a distant plane, Brian. Um, That's right. And 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 not only did you do a distant plane, but Volko, when he did uh, Andy and Abyss, uh, gave you a nod, a, a heavy nod in the designer's notes as to forming some of his views on how to game uh, insurgency. So would love to hear. A little from you about what that was like and starting off in this coin series in the early days. Sure, um, I'd love to. I, I guess I've told this story a couple times before to some other people, but uh, I never get tired of telling it. Um, so back in the 90s, I started publishing games uh, through something called the Micro Game Design Group with Carrie Anderson, and it was uh, desktop publish quality stuff. You know, uh, we put it together and uh, Carrie would print it off on his laser printer and we'd send it away in a comic book bag for whatever price it costs to produce and mail it. Uh, we were unusual in that we were a nonprofit war game publishing company, nonprofit by design, not by outcome, which made us unusual. Um, so one of the games that I produced, uh, you know, the, 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 the co-op put out something like, or the design group put out something like 45 titles in less than 10 years it was in business. And um, one of the games was uh, my game on Al the Algerian War. This was the first uh, game ever published on the, uh, uh, on the uh, Algerian War of Independence from 54 to 62 and published it in 2000. Um, and uh, for a long time, it was the only game available on the Algerian War uh, at any scale and in any, in any language until Kim Kanger put out Ici C'est la France in uh, 2010. Um, but with, two th with Algeria, it uh, was part of a family of insurgency games that I'd been working on called, uh, I call it the four box system now. I'd already designed a couple of games on uh, like the uh, Shining Path Gorillas in Peru uh, and uh, some other things. And then Algeria was one of them because I'd always been interested in, uh, you know, the Battle of Algiers and uh, you know the Algerian War, that kind of thing. It's a very interesting insurgency. So, um, towards the end of 2007, <clears throat> I was contacted by somebody who was working in the office of the Secretary of Defense at the time, and he said that he had been using my uh, Algeria game as the framework for a simulation game he was putting together on the uh, insurgency in Iraq. And uh, he was going to present some of his work at uh, a, a workshop on irregular warfare that was being put on by the Military Operations Research Society at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. And would I like to come and see and see what he'd done? And boy, would I. So I went there and I found out that this guy had been doing some things. And another guy who also worked in a different section of the Office of Secretary of Defense had been using um, my, uh, my Algeria game or sort of the system in Shining Path or Algeria uh, for his own game on, um, it's sort of like, a, it was like a computer assisted uh, insurgency game on the situation in an imaginary island in the South Seas. And uh, it was all full of Gilligan's Island references, you know, like the resistance movement was called the Minnows, and they were led by a shadowy figure known only as the Captain. 
Um, and, you know, it was funny, but it was kind of lost from the British guys who had come to this um, workshop that uh, the society had put on. Anyway, while I was there, I met a guy who was a teaching colleague of Volkos at the Sherman Kent School for Intelligence. And um, we were talking about my game. And afterwards, um, this, uh, this colleague, uh, it, he uh, contacted me and we worked out a sort of faster degraded version of Algeria that he could use in his classroom because he taught a class on revolutionary warfare. And so we, we worked it down, made a stripped down system that he could teach and have the, the guys play out in an hour and a half, two hour classroom. Just enough for them to get some of the ideas, the, you know, the difference between different classes of insurgents and that kind of thing. Anyway, Volko saw uh, Charles uh, teaching this stuff in his class and thought, oh, that's interesting. And he got his copy of Algeria and I think he liked what he saw. And yes, you're right, Harold, he name checked me in the, uh, the, the designer's notes as having contributed to the coin, some of the structure of the coin system, you know, asymmetrical menus of action, uh, differences between sort of like static fronts or, or uh, paramilitary organizations, uh, which are like bases. And then there's the idea of the guerrillas, which are like the more mobile, um, you know, more effective parts. And I was actually in on the, some of the play testing for Ende and Abyss um, long before I actually met Volko. And this is in 2010. And Joel Toppin was uh, doing uh, Ende and Abyss and uh, doing play tests on it. So I went to Consum World Expo that year and uh, I got uh, roped into uh, a play test of Ende and Abyss there. And I thought, this is really interesting. You know, this guy's really onto something. And I didn't see you know, the, I didn't see my stuff in there, but it wasn't until, you know, later that the game was actually published and Volko name checked me, for which I'm very grateful. And of course, everybody's got a good Volko story about how, you know, what a wise and generous guy Volko is. And it's so encouraging to see the way that Volko encourages others. Um, and uh, it's, it's great. But anyway, that was the start. And uh, after Ende and Abyss came out, Volko and I started to talk and we got into the idea, well, maybe we should do something together. And, uh, you know, what do you want to do? Well, why don't we do Afghanistan? And so that's how a distant plane came to be. And we put that together very quickly, I think. Uh, I think it was only a little bit over a year from the time that we started to sit down and sketch out rules to the time that it was actually hitting people's tables in physical form. Over. I should know better than to talk into that mute button. Did, uh, did you should know better than to ask me to talk. <laughs> That's true. Did, uh, did it surprise you, uh, the popularity of the game and the interest level? Uh, of the coin system generally? Well, I, or, or, or a distant plane? Distant plane. Or in Day and Abyss? Let's start with a distant plane. Well, uh, by the time and Day and Abyss, or sorry, a distant plane came along, um, it, that was the third volume in the series. And you'd had Day and Abyss and Cuba Libre out already. And on Day and Abyss, I'm sure that Gene must have really thought he was taking a chance at the time um, in agreeing to put that game up for P500. Because, uh, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of wargamers, they just don't really care, you know, about insurgencies going on in Colombia. But um, no, it made its P500 point. People started to play it. They saw it was a really interesting uh, series, uh, a, a interesting situation with an interesting series to back it up. And people just started building onto it from there. And I think we're up to what, 13 or 14 volumes in the series now that have been published or will be published. This Martian one, uh, Red Dust Rebellion, that would be volume 15, I think. So, um, and, and the print runs have been really, really good. Um, I'm not sure the ultimate numbers, but for uh, sales of pretty heavy duty war games, you know, with a, a fairly high price and such good components, um, sales have been really, really good. And we've got a whole family of people who really like the system. Maybe they like certain conflicts better than others, but uh, people really uh, see the flexibility in the system itself. Um, and so far we've done all kinds of, of conflicts. We've done sort of like occupation scenarios, colonial wars, civil wars, uh, you know, with Gandhi, we see the introduction of nonviolent factions. I've always thought that, um, you know, the, the coin system would lend itself pretty well to like a party politics or power politics kind of situation. Um, uh, that may come, 
yet. And now we've seen uh, play, uh, two player versions, three, three, four, five. Uh, there's supposed to be a six player um, form of a game out there. Um, so I'm just really pleased to see how well it's taken off, really captured people's imaginations. Yeah, absolutely. So after uh, A Distant Plane, you do the first two player game going back to your love for the Algerian war. I think it, that may be, is that your third game on the Algerian war at that point? Well, that was the third game ever published on the Algerian war. <laughs> and I've designed two of them. So there was like the initial one, the Algeria one, it's had a couple of editions, you know, since then. Uh, and then there's uh, Kim Kanger's game, which came in 2010. And then in 2017, Colonial Twilight came out. And the main challenge with that uh, was, you know, cracking the two body problem. And uh, I think we did that, you know, uh, um, the, the developer and I did that really, uh, 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 Jordan and I did that really well. I'm very pleased at how it came out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I- Well, you must've thought something about it too, Harold, because you made that two player scenario for the Southern- Yes. Uh, in Liberty or Death with that, did you, you, did you actually use that sort of home plate? I used exactly um, what, yeah, I yeah. stole it. I stole it directly from you and I tried to beat you to publication, but, uh, <laughs> but, but well, I did, if, but I if did you name credit. check, it's not really fact. <laughs> I did, uh, I did give you credit. Uh, and, and, you know, it was, it's, it's a great, it's a great uh, innovation. You guys did a nice job kind of working out how two players would make those decisions. What about, um, so now we're we're the, now you now you're uh, off to China, yep, and uh, and and that seems to be selling pretty well, not just pretty well, very well. Yeah, I don't think I've cracked thirteen hundred pre-orders yet, but it made its P five hundred point in a couple of days. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that's because there's uh, a couple of hundred people who um, uh, who uh, have um, sort of like a standing order for my wife's signaling to me. Does your wife have a standing order for it? Because that you get no, no. She, she admires what I do, but she's signaling it to me for something. Well, if you're being signaled to, cubes? you might want to attend to that. Cubes? You like cubes? <laughs> I, I I can't hear. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going deaf. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry to hear that. Anyway, uh, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, sorry. China's war. Yeah, yeah. China. Yeah. So but yeah, it's about just short of 1,300 pre-orders, I think. It made its P500 point really quickly. There, I believe there are a couple of hundred people who kind of have a standing order with uh, GMT, sort of, you know, sign me up for anything coin, you know, right. as soon as it hits P500, because right away it shoots up to like 200 pre-orders and then it uh, takes off from there. Yeah. Um, I've talked about uh, the, the structure and, uh, you know, what makes China's War uh, different. Uh, it's not super different. Uh, from other games, uh, but it's a, it's a different situation in that it's the first World War II uh, uh, period uh, coin system game. And uh, it's got, well, and Day and Abyss had three, um, thank you, hon. <laughs> she says, I'm cute. <laughs> All right, I'll take I'm it. not going to, you know, as long as she thinks you're cute, I don't think it matters what the rest of us think, does it? <laughs> that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, so it's it's a little different in that And Day in Abyss was a game where you had one government player and one counterinsurgent, three insurgent movements to, to fight against. And China's War is kind of the inverse of that because you have uh, the only insurgent faction is the Chinese communists and the other three are, are counterinsurgents. But at the same time, you've got three Chinese factions that are ranged against a foreign invader, the Japanese. Um, and, uh, but they all have their own agendas. So they kind of have to, it's, it's kind of, they're all united against the Japanese invader because if they don't cooperate enough, the Japanese will just take over the country and trample everyone. But at the same time, it's people kind of shoving each other like, hey, you, you do it, you, you first, you go, you go get them over there. And just trying to further their own agenda at the same time. So they want to come out on top. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Uh, Brian, you've been a big part of the history of the coin series and, and uh, I've learned a lot from you and your advices. And so, uh, so great to talk to you about that. I see that uh, the great Mark Herman is in the room. So I'm going to have to check in with Mark and see, uh, and see what he has to say about, uh, about the coin series. Thanks, Harold.
Thanks, Brian. Hey, Mark Herman, how are you, sir? Mark, we're probably muted. Well, yeah, can't hear you, buddy. That's all right, we can edit all this out. We can, uh, if you can write it on a slip of paper and show it to me, I can, probably too much. Looks like, uh, looks like Mark's reconnecting. Uh, but while we were working with Mark, I see the great Volko Runka in the room. Hello, Volko. <laughs> Can't hear you, buddy. Right. There. Am I muted now? Ah, excellent. Well done. I can hear you. How are you? I'm well. Long time no 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 talk. Yeah, we just came off of a marathon session of uh of uh with uh with a with a crew on how to uh how to play liberty or death. Very very topical. There you go. Um, but we you know, I just went through Brian Train and we we talked a little bit about uh of course his involvement in the coin series. Uh, and agreed that it was two and a half games at this point. Um, so, uh, you know, and also talked about his, his impact on your design when you first came up with the coin series, uh, which is kind of a cool story. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, would love to hear from you a little bit about context. Um, you, you know, you, you're coming off of, I guess, are you coming off of Wilderness War at this point? And... and uh, I was coming off of Labyrinth, yeah. which, yeah, which I had done essentially on commission from Gene. You know, he he had he had uh, had a conversation with me at uh, Expo, uh, two thousand nine, I think it was, and he had said, "Well, you know, if you could do an intelligent game about the the global conflict with jihadism, you know, I think I could sell that." Um, but you have to give a solitaire option so that. If you don't want to play the terrorists, you can still play Solitaire as the U.S. So that was what became Labyrinth. And so I did that for him, um, you know, and then when that did okay, I was able to come back to him and say, well, I did that for you. Now now I want I want to pick the topic and I want to do Columbia. And he didn't really have a choice at that point. He had to accept it. Where did your, where did your desire to do this sort of game and Columbia in particular come from? I mean, any, what were your associations? Uh, well, it, it was a, it was on a path from from labyrinth because the a premise of, of labyrinth it is was that the war on terror was really a global counterinsurgency that what Al Qaeda and its ilk wanted was to change governance and it was using terror and other means to do that and and insurgents as insurgents do uh, and so one critique of labyrinth was that it's hard to capture something as multifaceted, as multifactional as a global war on terror with just two players. Now there are rules in there that try to, you know, abstract alliance politics and the fact that jihadism is many disparate groups, lots of local groups, international organizations with their own agendas and so forth. There are rules in there to try to cover that, but it's a it's a pretty rough model with two players. And I thought, well, uh, if it's the case that insurgency, um, as Kilcullen has written, is, is typically multifactional in nature, I can get a better fidelity by making it a multiplayer game. And I'd like to zero in and not, not just this very, you know, 60,000 foot grand strategic global look of Labyrinth, but let me focus in on one country. And, and um, we had been using Brian's uh, version of Brian's Algeria game in the classroom to teach analysts how to think about insurgency and, and counterinsurgency in a dynamic way. And so I had been involved in facilitating some of that, really liked the, that system. And so a number of my ideas already about how does insurgency and counterinsurgency work on the national level came from Brian's 
Algeria game. And I said, well, let me take those ideas and, 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 and tr try to tell the story of Colombia, which um, I was fascinated by as an example, because at that time it was one of the cases in which the government had had a fair amount of success fighting not just insurgents, but three different insurgencies at once, uh, left wing, right wing, and, uh, and the uh, cocaine trafficking commercial insurgency, if you will. And, and doing well to re-extend legitimacy and, and government um, control over half of the country by acreage that had been given up for the last you know, 30, 40 years by the government. And these various factions, the three insurgents and the government, of course, were all doing deals with each other and cooperating and fighting each other in different uh, dynamic ways. And I thought it would make a great um, setting for a game system that allows diplomacy among multiple players. And that all, of course, became Andean Abyss. Wow. Um, and so you start with Andean Abyss. Um, you said Gene was skeptical about the marketability of Andean Abyss? Yeah, well, you know, uh, he, he was skeptical that he could sell a game about Colombia. And um, I guess because it was off, off, the, off the beaten track so to speak. And, uh, but as I said, he, he didn't have a choice at that point since, um, you know, he, uh, you made the trade. Yeah, we made the trade and he got labyrinth. And, um, I did tell him to sweeten the deal two things. One was it's going to be a series. So, you know, Columbia will just be the starting point and that's a plus for, uh, for marketability and, and future sales. And I told him that since I had, roughly I thought, but nevertheless pulled off coming up with a way to simulate a player as the jihadist and labyrinth, a solitaire system, that I'd try to increase the challenge and see if I could do that for three factions at once in the Columbia game so that you could play the government and take on all three factions as if you were playing three players, but with, uh, with flow charts, just like the jihadist flow chart in labyrinth. And so it was also offering up a solitaire game as well as a multiplayer game or a three or a two player game. And so that trying to put in every trick to get the audience to accept that, hey, a game about Columbia in the 1990s may be interesting, you know? Uh, and so Solitaire was another offering. And I remember um, we, 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 we launched the P500 and it was pretty laggy, you know, it didn't do too much on P500. And I said, well, I'm gonna try to, you know, I'm gonna try to build a bandwagon here and get out there and market and tell people why this is such a cool story. And this game has, is, ha offers some interesting things. And, and I remember Gene got on Consum World and he said, Hey, you know, um, we have this offering Andy and Abyss. It's from a, a pretty popular designer Volco and we're not getting a lot of orders. I'm just wondering why aren't you ordering pre-ordering Andy and Abyss? And it just completely knocked the wheels off the wagon because then we had at least a hundred different people get on Consum World and to answer Gene's question and tell you why you should not pre-order Andean Abyss, which um, was mostly, as Gene had feared, because I'm just not interested in the topic. You know, it was fair enough. I'm just not interested in Colombian insurgency and counterinsurgency. Although there was one individual who said, I'm very interested in Colombia. Um, but since this is the, from the designer who did the conceptual mess that is Labyrinth, I already know I have nothing to learn about Columbia from his designs. So that was one person. So anyway, so we went up from there. Just a lot of support and love from Consum World. Well, it's feedback. Yeah, no, it's, it's data, right? It's data. Depends on how you use it. Um, so one of the, one of the, one of my favorite parts of the coin series and, and, and your zeal is that uh, you know you you think several moves ahead? So you had Andy and Abyss, but then you'd also uh, I think you, you thought it would be three three games, and you had the next two. It it was in, I intended four volumes. Yes. Uh, Latin America, uh, Far East, Africa, Middle East. Uh, and the order I thought it would be would be Colombia, Angola, Bush War, the fall of Portuguese Angola. Um, Marcos in the Philippines, uh, and then Iraq. I want to do long, hard slog. I wanted to do Iraq 2003 to 2010. No. Uh, so 
I never got around to any of those. I bought, I did buy 300 bucks worth of Angola books. If anybody is looking for <laughs> building their Angola Portuguese counterinsurgency library. Uh, but uh, but uh, Jeff Grossman stepped forward with Cuba Libre before any of that happened. And of course we are now gonna get Ken T's Philippines game. So yes, yeah. that. And maybe even Trevor Bender's take on- uh, On, on uh, Iraq, Syria. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although by that time, of course, a very different Iraq Syria story than what it was when I was thinking of doing it. <laughs> I, I, I feel like you've stolen something from us, right? I mean, you're working on Blackbeard for all for, for God's sake. Uh, when you yeah, come. well, you know, he's an insurgent. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But not on the original list. No. Uh, I've wandered off. I was like, butterfly. Oh. <laughs> How does... The other thing that's striking about the series is just all the different designers that are involved now and all the great versions of, you know, I, I, it's, it's really extraordinary. And first timers like me uh, and, and others, and then, but also, you know, the great Mark Herman is, is, a, is, a, is another designer that's involved in this. How in the world does that happen? Oh, you're asking me? I, who else would I, you know, I'll ask Mark in a minute, but I'll ask you. Yeah, first. I mean, I mean, yeah, you have to ask them. I mean, how it happened with, with uh, Jeff and he can, he can, he can, t he can tell us, but uh, is he, he got in touch with me with an idea. Uh, and the idea was we can do Andean Abyss. It will fit the Cuban revolution, uh, of course, with some changes, but it's a good basis for telling the story of the Cuban revolution, which was a, a story that, that he knew interested him. And his idea was we would do it, uh, if I recall, we would do it um, in C3I. Uh, and we would just have corners instead of wood pieces, you know, but we could kind of quickly offer it. And, uh, and we took that idea to G and he's like, he's like, you know, oh no, we're gonna do this full scale. You know, we're gonna do this as volume two and we're gonna, with e everything, because it's gonna be, you know, it's gonna be great. And I guess Andy and Abyss by that time had made the, the threshold so that, you know, we, we knew it would be reality. And I mean, it went from there. It's it's from it's it's from it's from people having ideas and stepping forward. Now, I I had of course I wanted to do a game with. I did pitch Brian to do the the third volume, and I said, Brian, 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 you know, you gotta come come uh, work with a company that's going to give you wooden pieces and great mounted and all that stuff, right? And if you come do a game with me, you can pick what war. And he said, well, we got to do the holy grail of insurgency, counterinsurgency, and that's Afghanistan. And that's, that's how we got to a distant plane and so on. Right. Yeah, Fire in the Lake was, uh, that was Gene doing matchmaking, I yeah. think. Well, Mark, Mark can f fill in that. But I think that was Gene saying, you know, we need Mark to finally do his Vietnam game. And, and Volko, you're the one who can pester him until he does it. Something like that. Yeah, that's great. I kind of it's kind of wargamermatch.com. Yeah, it's not, yeah, that's Gene, yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And um and you know, early on developers, uh I know Joel Topham was involved. I see Mike Berticelli here with us. Uh he was uh he was of course developer for a number of titles including Liberty or Death. Mm -hmm. Uh and then you know, we got we've got Jason's involved now and uh it just the, the the team's extraordinary I, I and i i bring that up primarily to embarrass you but the other it's also important to th there aren't many systems in the gaming world where other people pour in and use the foundation that you created and go all these different directions and i think you know i don't i i, I assume that it has something to do with your ability to collaborate your kindness your patience all of these other things that we've all seen. Uh, uh, who are we talking about? <laughs> oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the the key factor you left off is my sloth. Okay. Okay. You know, because you know it's and I, and this is I and mean, Harold. Come on, don't be. You know how to do this. Delegate, right? You it's, you if somebody's going to do it for you for free, then. Right. You just <laughs> what's wrong with that? Yeah. Please, I'll take three. Yeah, that's right. That's so funny. That's so funny. Mark Herman, what, what what was it? What was it? Why did you? How did you get matched up with Volker Runk and 
what was what was good about it from your perspective? Well, I, I think, and he can correct me if I'm wrong. You know, um, when I was doing Empire of the Sun, weren't you like one of the early play testers of Empire of the Sun, Volko? I seem to recall that, but maybe I, I'm wrong. You, yeah, I think you sent me a set, a beautiful hand done set, yeah. and I played it, but I don't know that I contributed much feedback yeah, to you, I'm well, afraid yeah. to say. Well, it was everything you told me to do, I just ignored. That was what I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I told you something like, you know, this just the way you're doing Pearl Harbor, it's just going to wreck the whole game and it's not going to work or something that like that. It didn't cool, change yeah. anything. So, so what happened was um, Gene has been, you, you got to remember something, just like you, Harold, I had a, and many people on this thing, I had a real full time job. You know, it was, you know, and, and, and Gene wanted to do this Vietnam game. And I believe our first, a year before Andy and Abyss came out, we were talking about this Vietnam game. And they were, I mean, the, the one that got published is, um, you know, met all those original design. We had, I had notes. We had, you know, it was all basically there. And then Andy and Abyss came. And then I kind of like, you know, I had a ridiculous number of people working for me. I was just working stupid hours and I couldn't get much done uh, in that regard. And then like a year later, Gene went after me again and said, hey, you know, you should take a look at this Andy and Abyss game and talk to Volko again. So at that point, um, I guess my life had calmed down a little bit. I called Volko. And and so what I ever did, when, anytime I wanted to see if Volko was serious about a, doing a game together, I say, Nick the map. So he still owns me a map for the one we, we've been talking about, Volko. I haven't forgotten. Um, but he did the Vietnam map. And then once he did that, I said, okay. So then I started, you know, cranking out the event cards. And I, you know, cranked that. There's a lot of event cards <laughs> in that game. Um, you know, sort of like a, and of course, uh, we were using the, um, the coin system. And of course, we were using a, um, you know, the title is not just, it's not some cool title. It is actually the, I think it's the core thoughts behind the game. I think Brian would attest that, you know, Fire in the Lake is a very different take on the Vietnam War. It's a much more of a cultural, um, you know, intellectual history of the war versus, you know, the third division went this way and all that kind of nonsense. And so the, the big thing there was, I was, you know, we were trying to get across this notion that there was really three Vietnams and it was basically the, you know, the NDA and the VC were not in fact aligned uh, throughout the war the way that people say. And it's, by the way, there's starting to be books coming out now because, you know, now that we're getting further away from it, you're starting to see the memoirs of the VC guys uh, get out. I have about three or four of them. Uh, John Prodis and I have talked, you know, he's an old friend of mine. We've talked, and he's a real expert on Vietnam and we've had this conversation. So I, we had a different take on the war and, um, you know, I, I think it's been good. And of course, um, I don't know if Jason Carr is on here. There's so many names up here. Uh, I, but I don't, he was invited. I don't see him yet. Yeah. Uh, by the way, the thing that confused me was I was on Discord looking for you and they said, go over here. And then of course my microphone was uh, apparently was, fell in love with Discord. It wouldn't disengage uh, its love match with uh, Discord. So I, I tried I there. tried to lose you, but you caught me eventually. So yeah, you know, yeah, I had to chase you across cyberspace here. Anyway, so uh as you all know, um, the expansion full of Saigon is somewhere pretty far along, isn't it, Volko? I mean, I just, we're... Yeah, we're, we're in of, art. We're in art, you know, yeah, we're... It's yeah, going, to, we're going to China at some point. Um, yeah. I got the, uh, where is it? Uh, hang on. Yeah, just while he's getting that, what he said is right. So originally, we, I went up, I got to go to Mark's house. Uh, hey, Brian, near the Potomac. you recognize this? Oh, look at that, Brian. Hey, Brian. Look, baby. Yeah, go ahead, Volko. Yeah, so, and it was, it was that, it was basically, we're going to try to do, we're going to work together on the Vietnam game. And this was before, I mean, Andy and Abyss wasn't published yet anyway. It was definitely in work. And we talked about it was going to be maybe a block game, you know, but it would have some area movement. And the vision was that, 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 that you laid out for me is we were going to give the play as hasn't been done in other games, hadn't been done to the, the internal Vietnamese aspects of it. And this idea that you can have internal players following their agendas, but the external players come in to the conflict, right? To the domestic, to the internal war. And they start to mutate the conflict into something else that those who invited them in didn't 
initially intend. So you have this, you know, South Vietnamese, you know, Anam and Cochin and all that stuff going on. And now you've got the, the Northerners and, uh, and the whole communist bloc and the United States in, in the war. And, and you wanted to capture all that in a game. And I, I think it was, it was sometime after that, we realized, oh yeah, well, we could, we could do that with the, you know, with the, the building block being the model that was in, in Andy and Abyss. And when, as you were describing all that concept to me in your basement there, you said, you know, like in the book, Fire in the Lake. And I said, okay, well then let's call a game that. That's true. Uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, I've had somebody who actually, um, uh, you know, speaks and reads Chinese. Uh, the symbol that's on the, uh, the, the symbol of Fire in the Lake is Fire on the water is the symbol, is the, it's two, um, you know, hieroglyphs that come together. Fire in the water is the, is revolution. You know, it's, right. you know, there's gigantic opposites of war, fire and water. Uh, so, you know, that, it's, which is also obviously the title of the book. Um, and so Fall of Saigon is going to finish the story up, uh, as it were, and Fall of Saigon, the, 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 actually the two-player version, and again, right from the very beginning, Brian, we were going to use uh, the um, Colonial Twilight uh, two-player. That's That thing works perfectly. So we used that from day one. In fact, even before the game, I said, I'm going to use that. The horseshoe. The horseshoe. Is that what you guys call it? I mean, That's what I call it. So these are their actual counters, by the way. There's a track for the, uh, but you can see the counters, not many counters. Um, and the two-player part worked pretty much out of the box. I mean, that was never a problem. You know, there's, that, that's just the North versus the South. And it's got some fun elements to it with the Americans um, able to sort of do sort of interesting political things, but they don't do much militarily. They have some special forces things they can do. But the, the big challenge, which again, I give total credit, you know, Volko and I had a couple of conversations where we laid out how do you get from the war in 72 to through the Paris peace talks into the, into the end game. And that transition of the Paris peace talks, we got it basically right, but the number, the balancing of it was just a nightmare. And uh, I think you know, I played tested it at various WBCs. It was working pretty well, but you know, we got, Jason really got a good team together and they really beat it up a lot. So the final number, I mean, it was the same system, but the number crunching to get it to like, create the right incentives numerically uh, took a lot of work on Jason's part, but it's done now. And, I'm, and, and it was always like, uh, and of course this brings in armor. Uh, you know, we've got armor this time. It, armor played a much bigger role. And I had a pretty, I think, you know, it was a variant of the armor cavalry rule, but it works pretty well, I think. And so it should be pretty interesting. So you get um, some new, uh, some new wooden pieces to play with the armor pieces. Yeah, uh, yeah. that can do some cool things. And then with that Paris peace talks mechanic, you can link up the whole thing. So you can start in 1964 and fight the whole war, just looking ahead to having the good position at the peace talks and then wrap it up to the fall of Saigon if you're, you know, crazy. How do we designate yeah. uh, armor in wooden pieces? Is it a different shape or color? Yeah, it's like a, like a shape. triangle. It's a different yeah, shape. it's like a, it's like a, a wedge looking piece. It's, it's not unlike the, uh, isn't it like the cavalry piece you used in the... Nevsky. Nevsky it's, uh, no, it's actually distinct from, it's a, it's kind of like if you took the, the foot pieces in Nevsky, but you gave them a pointy end at one end, you yeah, know, yeah, it almost it. looks yeah. like a, it looks, it looks think like a, it's almost like, it's supposed to suggest a, uh, an M113. Yeah, but it's basically, it's basically a little arrow, I mean, where, you know, it's a pointy arrow, but you'll figure it out. It looks different than the other pieces. Uh, I'll tell you a, a real story. Uh, when I first got to work in Washington, uh, my boss had some friend over in like sort of the classified films division of the, of some part of the army. And I remember one of the first, we used to have Friday night movie night, uh, you know, in, in a skiff. And I remember seeing these films uh, from Vietnam of this period uh, after the United States had pulled out where they were using these, um, you know, uh, anti-tank guided missiles from hell from Cobra helicopters to um, knock out um, tanks on the uh, highlands because what had happened was the South Vietnamese troops had run away. They actually abandoned their tanks and their M113s and their M48s on the highlands. And the United States didn't want the uh, NVA capturing them. So they would send these uh, Marine helicopters in with uh, you know long, these long range uh, anti-tank missiles 
and they would and they would blow up the tanks. You know, they're empty. There's nobody. Nobody got killed in the film because they're just blowing up empty tanks. But they they destroyed them so that um, they couldn't be captured. So that's in the game also a little bit. I remember that film. It just it was one of those things. It's great. So, uh, Mark, do you have any funny stories about Volko? I kind of feel like if we're going to have a coin reunion, we need to. <laughs> I didn't. To... I didn't come here. I tell you, the the the, the funniest. It's a, consider it a roast. So I don't have a server mute button like on Discord. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, we so can the, you though. I think one of the funniest things I Volko and I have been you know friends for quite a while now. But if you want to see a good time, when we when Fire in the Lake was, uh, we were already kind of like in art by then for sure. Uh, we were pretty far along in art, and he and I shot a how to play Fire in the Lake video. Remember that at my house, and it was. I don't know what it was, but he was in a rare mood. So the, the video is him beating on me while I'm trying to film and run this stupid thing with him. And I actually enjoyed the hell out of that. So uh, I don't really have any particularly uh, good stories about well, That's so been a popular video too. It's been great. Right. Was, it, was it popular? I didn't know. I didn't really check. But um, I think that my best story about Volko is that he's incredibly fortunate he married Jill actually because pretty much he's a worthless human being without her. So I, I want to say that, I want to say that Jill is really the best part of Volko. Is that, is that okay, Joe, Volko? That, I, that didn't hurt, did that? <laughs> I, I've said that before and we also- Yeah, we all do, you know. <laughs> we also know she has a better computer than Volko does. I will tell you though, the fact that Volko dragged her across the entire Hadrian's wall, <laughs> I, was, I was looking at the little postings he had. It was just rather amusing actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. anyway i don't have much else to say I, i've been talking for hours today on the empire of the sun demo and i got what do we have tomorrow i'm gonna do some more in versailles yeah we oh. yeah we got some more talking to do tomorrow with uh, john butterfield mark so i hope you can yeah that's uh i got that nine is that gonna be a zoom call also like this one yeah well well, well it'll be it, uh, it faked me out I, I went to discord and then i'm gonna show you a completely computer. another i'm gonna show you another another uh software for that one Oh, good. And it's, so it's, it's, but it's, it's the easiest one yet. So you, oh. you wait, but thanks, Mark. And Volko, hang, hang with us uh, if you want to, but I want to get some questions. I want to, I, 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 I want to say one thing. I, I, I apologize, but um, it is uh, 10 o'clock here. And yeah. Go get some sleep. The baby's sleeping. I'm going to bed. So, yeah. you know, old man signing out guys. It's been good to see All you. Right. See you, Mark. Good seeing I'm going to hang, but I'm just going uh, to step up to get some uh, provender and be right back. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, in the meantime, uh, Morgan, if you're there, would love to hear about um, your experience with Pendragon, which was which was unique uh, in a number of ways, including Volko was the developer on Pendragon. Is that right? Right. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Now we've got. Um, well, I can't. I can't tell whatever I want if Volko is not in the room, right? Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I don't have many uh, <laughs> crunchy stories. Um, but yes, indeed, uh, Volko was the developer and it didn't start that way. I mean, originally, obviously, uh, uh, I came to um, uh, know Volko through um, Falling Sky. And um, because when GMT announced Falling Sky, well, which was then Gallic War, I believe, um, I was extremely interested by the theme and I was already hooked uh, to the coin series and I, I mean, I've said it before, I have a huge uh, debt of gratitude to Brian because it's because of uh, Distant Plane that I got hooked to the, to the coin series. Um, and so uh, I started uh, offering basically, you know, whatever capacity I can help with Falling Sky, um, I'm ready to do it. Uh, but at the same time, I had been sort of toying with some concepts of my own and uh, a completely different type of conflict where I thought the coin engine would be actually a very good fit and uh, but I was thinking it was way too you know way too uh, distant from the other games to actually uh, be uh, uh, in, in consideration and Falling Sky told me that maybe it could and I remember having a great conversation with Mike uh, Bertuccelli hey Mike and, um, and it was about Falling Sky and then somehow we start uh, just talking and uh, I mentioned uh, that I was I had been toying with stuff, so he asked me about it, and then next thing I know, Volko gives me a call. <coughs> so anyway, and um, so initially, Volko was definitely pushing, but he wasn't directly involved, as I should be. I mean, he was working on so many other things. And so I had um, 
someone else was supposed to be the developer and then it didn't quite pan out and Volko was still involved and uh, at some point we were looking for another developer and Volko said, you know what, I'm going to be your developer except I can't do it right now because I've got Falling Sky to complete. Um, so, um, but he was always, always involved and then, uh, I mean, obviously working with him was a, a tremendous experience, especially for, for a first time um, designer like, uh, at least release designer like myself. Um, so I, I count myself extremely fortunate, not only to have been able to build on the uh, great foundation of the coin series, but also to have Volko with me <laughs> when that happened. Um, so, yeah, that's pretty good, Morgan. Uh, you know, when uh, when I came up with the idea for Liberty or Death, uh, Volko spent a lot of time, gave me great advice and counsel. But I said, uh, "Do you want to work together on it?" And he said, uh, "No." And so, so I went I went it alone. Of course, I had Mike Berticelli, who's here. I'll talk to in a minute. But uh, you're very you're very fortunate to get Volko's time, and that and that you know that means you know I think he votes with his passion. So he loved the the ancients and the and the story that uh, Pendragon told. Right, and I and I, as he has been he has explained later. I think what really drew him to to this particular concept, and that's the. Uh, this thing, which so far I think is, is specific to Pentragon, even for I hope we will see it in other games, where where the um, you know the core objectives and victory thresholds and, and some game mechanism evolve through the game because to reflect because we have a long view. I mean, Pentragon does not uh, last a couple of years or even maybe twenty years; it, it lasts centuries, and so. Things are different from from you know when you start and when you finish, and that had to be captured in the game. And I think this is what drew Volko in. He, he loved this concept of of the games, conditions, and uh, objectives shifting progressively throughout the game. Yeah, yeah. Among I'm... other things, probably, but uh, that, I'm pretty sure that was the one thing that really drew him in. Hey, Volko, am I right? Hey, yeah, it's it's system transformation. And I don't right. think there's any, uh, you know, and certainly not as of that volume. Um, we'll see. I mean, Follow Saigon does this a little bit with the Paris Peace Talks, I guess. But until that point, what we had in these insurgency games was, well, there's a long-running insurgency, and we're going to focus in on perhaps the most interesting part of it. But the, the nature of the interactions are essentially the same at the beginning and is at the end. The rules are the same, the victory is mm -hmm. right. And what, what Pendragon takes us through is the transformation of R Roman Britain, this organized, integrated Roman defense against the barbarians that has been holding out for some centuries, right? At the time that it starts to break apart and transform the island into what becomes a constellation of Dark Ages kingdoms, right? And you start at one and you end at the other. And that, that's, that's uh, something that's so special to see is system transformation. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to veer too much away from the coin uh, subject, but the funny thing is that this concept did not originate with Pendragon. Uh, this concept actually I first developed so when I was working on Hubris, which is now at long last, Yes. Uh, coming to um, to light, but 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 same thing. I mean, I'm, it's a it's a hinge period, and the, the the parameters are not the same when we start as when we end, and uh, it's a completely different way uh, the, the way it is modeled in in Hubris. But this concept that you just cannot operate under the same assumption and the same parameters at the beginning of the game and late in the game was not developed for Pendragon. It was developed for Hubris. Yeah. So interesting. Um, so Morgan, hang with us. I'm going to I'm going to rally some questions from the group, uh, and I'll ask the group to get ready. But I want to talk to Bruce Mansfield a little bit. Um, Bruce is um, Bruce is the designer of Gandhi, and um, really tested the system by providing some uh, uh, by providing a faction that was a nonviolent faction. So. Uh, Bruce, how are you? Love to hear about your experience with uh, Coin and and uh, and Volco. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, thanks for putting this together. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I, I think like a lot of folks, I have my my Volco story is um, 
tons of support, lots of trust, saw the system, saw my, my project through to the end uh, and it was, it was always kind of there. So I, I like, can't say enough good things about uh, vocal support. So my funny vocal story is first time designer. So I had no idea how this whole thing worked out. Um, I, I didn't know anybody that had published a board game. I did, so look online, try to find as much information as I could. Somewhere I read an uh, interview that Volko had given where he said basically like, yo, people come to me all the time with coin ideas. I very rarely get a, a playable prototype. So I thought, okay, so if I'm gonna actually make a game and, and send it off to Gene or Volko, I didn't know how that worked. I'll probably send it to Volko. It's gotta be pretty darn good. So I, I taught myself some graphic design elements. I taught, I, I figured out how the Vassal module worked. I, I just, I tried to ice out the whole thing. We had a rule book that had graphics and I spent way too much time on this. So I sent it off to Volko and uh, giant email. And I thought, okay, we're gonna have this kind of, A, I didn't know if he was, if he was gonna respond and he was very gracious about responding pretty quickly. And I thought he's gonna ask me all sorts of intense questions about how do you model this? And what does this mechanic have to do? And why is this 37 and not 43 or whatever it might be? I think he asked me two questions. How long have you been working on this? And how many people have seen it? And it became pretty clear that his concern was, what's the team that you have around this project? And helping me move from building a thing that's kind of cool, but for yourself versus something that is worth putting out into the world where people actually want to play it. And it, it's got that nice combo of it's interesting and it's fun. And he was uh, pretty helpful in that, that process. I, I think within a month of me sharing it with him, he got a playtest together on um, a Vassal playtest. Volca was there. Mike, Mike Predicelli was there. I think, Harold, you might have been there, actually. I, I was there, and I, I, I have a couple of <laughs> recollections from it. First of all, it was I think it was shortly after you wrote the letter to Volco, but it seems like it was four in the morning or something. What was the, It was un, some unbelievable hour, and I'm thinking, how in the world? Why are we doing this? And then the early or late. I can't remember for us <laughs> West Coasters. crazy, right? <laughs> and then we, we have the meeting. And which, but it had to be 4 a.m. because that's 7 a.m., which is when Volco starts working, right? So yeah. <laughs> it was 4 a.m. our time, and and we meet, and uh, and and it's finished. It's a finished product. You had it in Vassal. You had stylized the card so it looked like it was f final art from GMT. The map was wonderful, and it, and I'm thinking this is done. This is the first time anybody's seen this. This is crazy. And yeah, that was were the were the uh, were the solitaire cards already? They were still in the future. They were they were a ways off. I, I had a I had a notion of redesigning the solitaire system, but hadn't gotten yeah, there yet. You didn't uh, mention that it wasn't yeah it wasn't there yet. Uh, and I think actually getting it to look good was probably the biggest mistake that I made with the project because uh, I think a lot of folks figured it was a finished game because it looked finished like um and it was it was another year and a half or so of, of pretty rigorous development to really hammer it into shape um can, can i can i tell you a story that'll make you feel better about that yes please <laughs> so i don't know who here has had the chance to play the first twilight struggle prototype that jason and ananda and um vonda brought to the con uh before it was before it was WBC, but the, you know, Don Con there. Well, I played it with them and it had all wooden pieces. It had a kind of a 3D game board. All the cards had images and those, in, in those days, I didn't put images on my own cards. I did that later. All the cards had images and all the cards were laminated. So I said to Jason Ananda, I said, you realize you're going to be making a zillion changes to these cards and you've already laminated them you know just think about that so this is you know all the greats do the same thing on their first design that's right that's right well i think i had a nice combination of i had a topic that was screaming for game design and nonviolence is is woefully underrepresented not only in strategic gaming but also historical studies uh, along with just like this insane amount of naivety that i had i had no idea how much work i was taking on and and uh, I look back now and I'm like, oh my God, I, it was insane how much uh, effort it took to get it over the finish line. And I remember I called Harold and I called Morgan pretty pretty early in the process and just said like, give me advice. Tell me tell me what I need to know and what I don't know to ask because I, I don't know anything about this. And 
Um, you both gave me really solid advice and it kind of boiled down to, it, this is your game. So don't settle for, for anything less than what you want to, the game to say, but be really clear on what that story is. And once you've figured out what that story is, get rid of everything that doesn't support that narrative. If it's merely cool, you gotta, you gotta chuck it. And we got rid of so much cool stuff, but you're right, it, it didn't help the flow. And Jason and Scott and I, we spent a lot of time working on Gandhi to try to make it quick and accessible and to be easy to read and to flow smoothly. And we did a lot of work to, to, to cut stuff out of it because we didn't want the bulk that was in there. Now, in my non-gaming world, I'm a, I'm a high school history teacher. So my entire profession is trying to get teenagers to pay attention to things that I think matter, but they couldn't care less because like they're 15 and you know, your brain doesn't work when you're 15. So we brought a lot of that design element into the game process so that when we did jump into the solitaire system, and um, again, I remember asking you, Harold, is like, what do you think about doing something different than flowcharts? And you basically said, yeah, go for it. You know, people are gonna be upset about that, but give it a shot. Um, and we ended up doing a, a different system that the, our, our core design philosophy for the card-based bot that became Arjuna is now Chung for Vietnam and, and Taesan for fall, fall of Saigon was to keep it usable, keep it accessible and keep it simple. And I, I think we hit most of those uh, design goals um, through it. Yeah. So my recollection is Gene came up with the name Gandhi. Yep. What was your original name? I wanted to call it Hin Swaraj, um, maybe overestimating the extent to which the American market would be comfortable with uh, Hindi. Um, and, Gandhi, and Gene was like, no, no, call it, no. Call it Gandhi. And he's right. It was, you know, that's what Gene does. Do, do you know what the original name was of Andy and Abyss? Mm -mm. <laughs> do you know, Harold? No idea. No. The original, I originally wanted to call it FARC. <laughs> and I asked my friends, you know, my friends, and then one said, I don't want to play a game called FARC. I said, oh, okay, yeah. come up with something else. <laughs> yeah. I had something similar with Ben Dragon. <laughs> and the that original... was a long story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The original title I wanted for Colonial Twilight was Denouement, which I thought mm. worked on several levels, both in English yeah. and French. But, you know, you got to have a, a game title in English. You know, sometimes German you can, you can use. But, you know... Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah I'll, but, you know, Algerish and... Abhang Abhangingskrieg or something like that. You know, it's too. Bob it wouldn't fit on the box. Yeah. <laughs> what? So we just wasn't it going to be Black Sun or something like that? What well, happened to that? I remember us having a discussion about that Volko. I I like Denouement um, just because of its idea of conclusions and things like that. And we did talk about Black Sun because there was a um, an Algerian poet. He he was like a, a contemporary or protege of uh, Albert Camus. And he wrote a poem about that. Oh, maybe I'm confusing that with another one, which was like the sun under arms or, you know, the armed sun or something like some, that. Something like that, yeah. And yeah, so anyway, just some poetic allusions and these kinds of things. But uh, so, no, in the end, we went with Colonial Twilight, which was the title of a very good article by John Prados about the Algerian War that appeared in Campaign Magazine way back in 1973. I don't know if Mark is here to... to to note that a anyway um it's a good title it's in english you know jean senac oh. yes that's right some e-bomb has just said jean senac and it's it's right um so, so, Brian, mind, it's going, my... so, so when colonial twilight eventually gets a french version are you going to call it denouement well that's an interesting question because i don't know if many people know this but there are french versions of some of the coin system games coming out. Uh, Falling Sky is the first, of course, I've heard because everyone loves yep. Asterix. Uh, I don't know if they have other titles planned. What, what uh, do you know, Morgan? I, I, know, I know that there is an agreement between, so Asyncron is doing the, the French versions, uh, who's been working with Phalanx on some other games. Uh, so they've got two games um, in uh, which they have contracted with uh, with GMT, I'm not entirely sure how much I can say, but I can say there are two which are agreed, uh, which are two very heavy coin games, let's put it that way, including one which is very dear to me. <laughs> um, so, but, but I know they are, they are planning to have all 
coin games, um, you know, French Shifa, I don't know, uh, at some point. Uh, I am very curious as to how Colonial Twilight, whether it's titled Denouement or not, is going to do uh, yeah. in France. Yeah. <laughs> It'll either be really popular or I'll probably never be allowed to set foot in, on French soil. <laughs> From what I can say, it has definitely set foot on French soil. It's, it's being played, no question. Yeah, I've never had a bad reaction, you know, from a French player. Uh, but usually players just, you know, if they have anything to say to me, it's usually positive, which is great. <laughs> yeah. But the, uh, yeah, and the good thing is that the, um, uh, the localization of uh, Falling Sky, they redid all the art for the event cards uh, with a French artist. And I, I really, I really like because I, actually helped with uh, basically proofing and not, not, not proofing, but, but helping with basically turning to French uh, Phoenix Sky. Uh, Merci. Which, is, which is the second time I get involved a little bit in this good game. And, uh, and I love the, the artwork. And so actually um, this guy is going to do the artwork for Hubris. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. So we've got, uh, we've got a room full of people here that I'm sure have some questions. Um, I would love it if you have a question, if you could raise your hand in the uh, participants uh, section, that might be the best way for us to do that. And then I can call on individuals one at a time. And there are a number of ways to do that. Um, you can let me know if you have a question, you can type it in the chat. Uh, you can hit yes or no on the participants menu or anything, and that will tell me uh, that you have a question or uh, any other appropriate means rather than us kind of speaking out of order. Does anybody have any questions they want to ask of, uh, of Volco or any of the coin designers, anyone? Uh, there we go, John Carter. What, yeah, uh, so. Yeah, the floor. Um, one of the things I think that's extraordinary about the coin system is how flexible it is at uh, reflecting themes from ancient eras through to modern times and still with the same very tight engine and set of rules. What I'm interested in from a designer point of view is to what extent have you felt constrained by the system and been tempted to change the core mechanics, to break them, to bend them, to allow you to have a more thematic experience set in a particular period in history, or, 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 or did you not? John, are you interested in someone in particular, or is it for the group? No, no, uh, well, uh, any, one, any one of you. Well, I would say that Pendragon is, may still be the one coin game which strays the, the farthest away from the common core. Um, but it's not like, well, I mean, I. Uh, that, that some changes were needed. I think they were mostly introduced from the get-go, at least 90% of them. Uh, so when I presented the very first prototype to Volco back in, when was that, September 2014? Uh, in they, in, they in a in. hotel lobby, I recall. Exactly, exactly, on a tiny, on a tiny table. And, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, and I was like, okay, maybe Volko is going to say no way, <laughs> uh, but it didn't, uh, and so and so it was. So no, I never felt constrained. I mean, I, I, I there were some interesting mechanisms that I felt um, were very appropriate, so I reused them. Everything else I changed, but I changed trying to stay in this general spirit. I tried. Um, but I think Pendragon is probably the, the one which, which, by the way, is why it gets, I guess, a reputation for complexity because there's the biggest step to do for people who are used to the, to the original series. I, I would think the biggest, the, the change that I never would have, um, well, I certainly hadn't conceived of it, and I think I would have called it impossible if it hadn't been done, and that is how do we deliver an experience that's like the coin sequence of play, but for two players in a dedicated way. And so I think Colonial Twilight in that that horseshoe, and I think Brian, I think it was like the third, because you did something and I was like, oh, that's really brilliant. And then you said, no, I don't like that. I'm gonna do something else. And then you did a third thing was that before you got to how that would work. And I know there are many, many players who prefer that 
right to the to the to the original sequence of play and it has a great um you know use of the events in the battle for initiative that doesn't really exist certainly not in the same way uh in the in the standard coin sequence of play where if you if you can make use of the event you can keep hold of the initiative and who controls the next card and the next event in colonial twilight um which I mean, it's just it's just delightful, and it's it's really it really is it's just a whole different thing. We need it just going to be in Fall of Saigon, as Mark showed you. So we need a whole tile to just like substitute the the rule structure of the core aspect, the sequence of play, and yet it really does deliver a very similar kind of set of dilemmas and feeling um, and and relationships between ops and events as the rest of the system. So that that's the thing I think I when I think about. Um, what if you if you if as brian decided he wants to do algeria again don't have enough games designed by me on algeria so i'm going to do another algeria game it's going to be in the coin series but there are only two factions and now what do i do and you did it well thanks Volko. um yeah it's a uh, well I, I guess um it was like the last day of uh the consum world expo uh you know mark simonich sat down with me and said well, Gene thinks there ought to be a, a coin system game on the Algerian War, and you ought to do it. So what do you think? And I thought about it. And originally, I was thinking about a four-faction game. But, you know, I've, I've gone back and forth on this. You know, Morgana, I remember us having some long discussions about this. Um, and uh, in the end, I went with, with two factions because I thought there were two tendencies. Uh, as Volko mentioned, uh, David Kilcullen, uh, the writer on Insurgency, has noted that every insurgent movement is very, very factional. Uh, and sometimes that gets in the way of it functioning and sometimes it, it doesn't. Um, so you just have to kind of figure out what altitude you want to examine the problem and try to break it down from. Um, so I would say that, um, you know, cracking a two-body problem like that was the biggest departure uh, from, the, uh, from, from the coin system generally. But I've designed whole families of games uh, that have a lot of asymmetry in them, um, where you've got asymmetrical victory conditions, mechanics, all these kinds of things. Um, and so that's the, uh, for me, that's the really attractive part of uh, of the coin system and how and how flexible it is really um so with the, the other games that i've done you know they, they kind of uh you know they, they still kind of stay within the general pale of uh of, of the coin system games uh but the the type of s of situations and scenarios that you can portray is really flexible and and really good uh, is, is that's the main attraction for me in doing that. Um, there's so much that you can do just within that, the particular structure of a coin system game. There's so much, so many changes you can make uh, and different things that you can emphasize just by tweaking a, a mechanic or maybe adding or subtracting something. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's, like, um, it's like different, it's like different structural schemes for poetry. You know, like a sonnet, for example, you've got certain things that you have to uh, observe, you know, uh, or coarsely a, a limerick. Okay, a limerick's got to observe a certain kind of rhyme and syllable structure. But within it, boy, you can get really filthy or not. So it's like the coin like series, the, the coin series, the limericks of wargaming. E sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's see. There was an old man from Hanford. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Let's keep it PG, Brian. Hey, there's a so there's a question for Volko in the in the chat, and the question is, Volko, uh, did you get much pushback on using wood pieces instead of counters in Andy and Abyss? Yeah. And then and then the next question is, is that is Andy and Abyss a war game? Uh, is Andy and Abyss a war game? <laughs> I'll leave the war game question to you, Harold. That, be, you. That's that's your department. Um, you know, I got no push for at that point. We had Labyrinth, uh, where I had already pushed for the little wooden pieces and gotten them. And I just kind of pushed that further. I said, well, now I want a lot more wooden pieces. And we had in Labyrinth 
a breakthrough came from Tony Curtis, which was if we had to have wooden pieces that could be cells that were, um, you know, underground sleeper cells and cells that were exposed, activated. And uh, I wanted to put, have stickers on one end. And Tony Curtis said, no, if you put stickers on a, on a wooden piece and it's face down, it create, gets a lot of gook around the sticky edge of it. So if you're going to turn pieces, you can't use stickers, I can emboss them. And I said, you can emboss them? What? You know, wow, let's do that. And they were so, you know, pretty the way they came out. They said, well, now I'm going to just go wild. And we're going to have tons of gorillas and they're all going to have embossed stars on them and it's going to look beautiful. So GMT was not the issue, but I, there was some, I don't know if it was a lot, but there was certainly pushback from, you know, war, from the wargaming tribe, which was, this is not a, a serious thing unless you have, I don't, a paper piece that has a silhouette of a soldier on it and numbers right You're and, and so we did have um fans out there a couple of them at least work up their own homebrew versions of the military units in um in andean abyss and you know it, it's an, it's in, it's interesting as a reaction because it doesn't really convey any more information if you in fact less if you have a stack of counters it's actually harder to see how many there are which is all that really matters in, the, in this symbol how much what type are they and how many are in this space is really what matters so i don't know how well it works and i and i don't understand myself why it's more transporting more realistic to see a silhouette of a soldier gigantic lying down across the landscape of colombia than you know, a wood shape. And I've gotten a bit of the same reaction with Nevsky, by the way, which similarly uses different shapes and colors to be the different types of troops. And so to the degree to which we actually in the box put little counters that have, you know, the symbology and, a, you know, some silhouettes and the numbers and so forth. I don't know how many people use them, but we put them in there in case you prefer it. But again, to me, if I'm imagining a formation of troops on the field and I'm looking at it from a distance, like I'm in the sky looking down on this, this battlefield, it's not going to look like the silhouette of a single soldier lying down on the field. I mean, there's something in the, you know, in our wargaming consciousness from having played the games we've played that look the way they do that that, that transports us, but it's not inherent, I think, to the form. And so the hope is that with something like the coin series or with Nevsky, you know, uh, traditional war gamers like us can, can get over that and say, well, even though it has colored little wooden cubes, it can still be a serious model of warfare. And also then that that look might attract players from the world of Euros or whatever who say, well, you know, if I can play other games, with colorful wooden cubes to determine area control and so forth. You know, I can, I can, I can play a game set in Afghanistan too. And it's, I, there's no reason to be afraid of that. You're absolutely right, Volko. I, I have seen, I don't know how many sour comments from war, real war gamers about how they couldn't take a distant plane seriously because it didn't have little cardboard chips with stray numbers and, and markings on them. I mean, you could get rid of the wooden pieces and just draw your own counters and flip them around. Um, but these people are really kind of missing the point. There was a guy who noticed with Fire in the Lake that coincidentally there were the same, there was the same number of American green cubes as there were American combat brigades had fought in Vietnam. So he automatically made this unconscious fake verisimilitude assumption that one cube was one brigade. So he made up a, a sheet of tiny little stickers of brigade patches. And I think he's even selling them at one point. It, I mean, so but that that's, people, isn't that beautiful? That's dedication. That I, is I love dedication. That. That, that is dedication, yes. Uh, and, and, but, you know, number two things there. Number one, it got gook on the board from the stickers. Uh, and number two, he was missing the point because I've tried to explain this. It's like people were, were, were wondering, like with the police cubes, for example, in, um, in, in a distant plane, like the Afghan National Police, they, there's a, 
you know, at the time there's police spread evenly all over the whole country, but there's only cubes in certain places. And I try to explain it as, you know, the forces, the force pool that a unit, that a, that a faction has, cubes of different colors, uh, troops or police or, or guerrillas or bases or whatever. It's like a cloud of potential energy and it manifests itself at certain points on the board in certain areas. And a cube isn't necessarily a combat brigade or a fire base or anything like that. It's, it, it, it can be more, it can be less. It's just that's where force, the total amount of force that that faction has available to use is usably concentrated in that time in that space to interact with other things that are in the area. Uh, and it's not this, this, this kind of um, verisimilitude and people agonizing over whether, you know, something should be rated a six or rated a seven. Uh, you know, just forget all that. And that just doesn't seem to, it just either glides past people or they just don't even want to consider it in the first place. And that's Which, why you get a lot of sour commentary about, oh, well, you know, it's a Euro but made up as a war. And it's surprising years. because actually all war games do the very same thing. It's absolutely. You know, how many times have we read, well, when a unit is removed by Defender Eliminated, it doesn't mean that that unit got wiped out to a man. What it means is that unit is no longer combat effective. It's the exactly. same, you know, ball of energy concept. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so, so it just, it, it amused me with the little tiny brigade patches and thinking of people pasting these little brigade patches on their green cubes. <laughs> I'd love to see the, I'd love to see the passion, Brian, and I think it's clearly a war game based on that explanation. Here's uh, <laughs> another question. I've got, well, let's get through a couple more questions and we, then we'll have to run. But uh, the next one is addressed to you, Brian. What issues have you run into designing China's war? Oh, um, well, uh, that's a really good question. Um, of course it I, is. This is a high class crowd here, Brian. Yes, it is. Very high class crowd. Very well behaved too. Yes. No, no obscene Zoom bombers showed up yet or anything. Not yet. Uh, I was, uh, I was told as a, this was a briefer tip. Never tell a general office officer that he or she just asked a good question. Ah. Uh, okay. Is it, can the general say it's a good question? General can say it for sure. <laughs> general can say anything she wants. Yeah, I know, but I'm not a general, so um, I, 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 I leveled off of lieutenant. So anyway, um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it was, I think I had the basic concept, you know, from the beginning of, uh, you know, three Chinese factions ranged against one Japanese foreign invader. I had already designed uh, a, a game on, um, on, on China from 1937 to 41 called um, uh, Battle for China. And I designed that back in like 1999 and it's had several editions since then, but it's always been the same sort of thing. So I'd already done a lot of the research and I already had set in my mind the kind of general parameters uh, and mechanisms I wanted to lay into the game um, to have the game show like the narrative I wanted the game to deliver. Um, but mechanics uh, have been adjusted over time and I've had to kind of do a little bit of figuring and chopping and changing with that. One thing that's unusual about China's war is uh, the nature of the Japanese objectives. Um, one thing, okay, not every game in the coin system uses uh, lines of communication uh, or LOCs, not all of them use it. Uh, but in a, in a coin system game where you do have LOCs, uh, a, a real light bulb moment for a lot of players is when they realize that an LOC is not a boundary between two areas. Well, it is that, but it's also a space in its own right and it offers you things to exploit. Now, the nature of the Japanese invasion and occupation in China was what some people have characterized as like a dot and line occupation because the Japanese would seize the cities and they would do that and they would also dominate the railway lines or the rivers that connected uh, the, the, the cities, which held the useful parts, the parts of China that were useful to them. And if you don't understand about lines of communication and how to dominate them and how to use them, you won't be able to play the Japanese in that game and effectively, and you won't be able to um, counter them effectively. So that's kind of a, um, uh, something you have to, you know, kind of grok right away. 
uh, because if you're just going to play a coin system game as an ordinary area movement game, it's it's not going to you know the, the the light bulb's not going to come on for you. So there's that's one thing that people have to uh, have to do. Um, the other thing is uh, another thing is the nature of the nationalist faction uh, or the, the the nationalist party, because the nationalist party is, well, the, the, the sort of Chinese government resistance to, to the Japanese is divided into two factions. There's the, there's the central KMT, Guomindang Nationalist Party, and there's what I call the warlords faction. Now, these are people who are part of the government up there, generally like regional authorities in their own right. They have a history Many of them have a history of the warlord era, so they still have their own agenda. So yes, everybody's kind of on the same side, but they but they have uh, these different um, have these different agendas to each other, and so the uh, that kind of balance and trying to get that right between them uh, was uh, another point of development. Originally, when I, I started out with it, I had three color factions for the warlords. Um, and so like the, the three of them together formed one faction, but whenever you wanted to do something in a turn in the game, you could only do it with one color of the three factions. Uh, and that was one way to do it. And it looked okay. And everybody was sticking to the regions and that sort of thing. Uh, but Gene took one look at it when I showed it to him at Console World Expo and uh, he didn't like that. It, and he had a point, it did look a bit like a six bean salad in terms of color on the map, like somebody had spilled a big, uh, you know, it's like somebody had spilled a risk set, you know, onto the, uh, on, onto the map. So again, uh, I reduced them to like one color green faction, but you know, those are the two major sort of major developments or major points in the game. Um, since then, I've just been kind of tuning, you know, victory levels and victory margins. Uh, as always, the great bulk of work with a coin system game is the event card deck, doing research on the events, deciding, you know, this is enough of a thing to maybe make a card about it, and what effect should it be, and, you know, if it's a two-text card, you know, what should the other text be, and that is always a part uh, that you have to grind through, and uh, that can be a difficult part in development yeah, as well. Yeah. And to make that counter event plausible. Uh, oh, there's another question here, if I may. Yeah. Uh, let me yes, let me jump ahead absolutely. to you. And not just the flip more, side so of the let other. Give, let me let me let me jump to one more, Brian. We've got um, uh, Sav Savarillo asked. Uh, speaking of breakthroughs, hmm. does anyone care to describe any breakthroughs uh, or breakthrough moments in the development of the games? Does anybody guess, had? Did anybody have any breakthrough moments that they would like to? I can think of, uh, I mean, there, there certainly were, I can, there's one I think of from Andy and Abyss going back to way early. So, and that's on the, the victory conditions. And I originally had that uh, it would depend for the, for the guerrilla factions, the AUC and the FARC, a lot on how many guerrillas they had deployed. And the AUC had to have, you know, more within a certain margin of the FARC. They're trying to defeat the FARC militarily. And so you ended up with all these gorillas spread on your your map, like a spilled risk set, of course. And uh, and and every time you're assessing victory, you're crowning up all these little gorillas, which is a big pain in the ass. And uh, and to avoid that pain and delay, I converted that from counting gorillas mm -hmm. to counting bases because there weren't that many bases. And uh, in fact, Joel had, because it's a comparison between AUC and um, FARC for the AUC victories, and had us put that base track next to each other, similar to the way you do the forts in the Indian villages in um, Liberty or Death. But it was just that going from, it's just such a pain to count so many damn gorilla pieces. It's much easier to count bases. And actually that makes sense. If you think about bases as infrastructure, um, it makes sense for that to be a victory um, condition for the guerrilla faction and a long-running insurgency that that led to very many coin series victory condition have to do with how many of those bases forts and live your death are like bases right how many of those bases do you have compared to how many does your enemy have that that came out of it just being tedious to count gorillas 
I'd say my my breakthrough would be uh, visualizing home plate. You know, just the, the, the visual graphic aid for that two player structure for Colonial Twilight. Uh, I get, I was just staring at the ceiling, you know, in the middle of the night, very early morning, you know, just the way middle aged men do. And uh, just thinking about it and just kind of, kind of kind of warping the idea from a flowchart into a graphic representation of sort of the states that the flowchart could be in. And uh, that's how it came about. And uh, sometimes you can, you get, you just get a, a visual, um, a visual flash of something uh, and uh, you can show it in an effective and simple way. I think that was a, a really good, that was a breakthrough moment. Absolutely. Uh, Bruce, Morgan, Mike Berticelli, any breakthroughs? Yeah, for uh, Gandhi, we spent a long time trying to figure out how we're going to get the nonviolent factions to feel like a third faction type in the modern coin system. And we didn't just want to reskin a revolutionary faction and make it, call it nonviolent. And the, I think we had two breakthroughs, one of which was having, and I think Gandhi might be unique in this case, of having control based solely on active pieces. So that activists and guerrillas that are underground are effectively subsumed within the massive populations of India. And we wanted to find a way to, to model how the British were able to exercise political and civil control with very, very few forces uh, in, in India. And in fact, relied for the bulk of their, oh, thanks, Brian, um, for the bulk of their, their, their manpower on, on Indians to, to work uh, with, uh, with the Europeans of the British uh, uh, there for, as part of the, just the, the government forces. Um, we call them sepoys in the game. So that, 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 having control based solely on active pieces uh, puts another layer of, of play where uh, the, the guerrilla forces can activate uh, through terror and that alone can be enough to tip uh, space into uh, to losing uh, Raj control. And then the real breakthrough for the nonviolent factions was moving them away from resources. And I'd always had two nonviolent factions that Muslim League and the Indian National Congress that had, I, I wanted as much as possible that their operations and special activities were almost identical, but their, their victory conditions were different so that over time, they effectively start at the same spot and then they develop these very different uh, pathways through the narrative of the game. And we initially had them share resources, which just doesn't work mechanically. They just, it's like a race to spend them. So we had this kind of aha moment of, well, they don't need resources. And then it turns out that better models the effect of a nonviolent insurrection that they can simply raise far more forces and far more people will join a nonviolent uh, yes, resistance movement than will a violent one. And so it was, it's just nice when the, the mechanics work out for the game, but it also better models of the history that you're trying to tell. And then we built those into the, 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 the crisis track that I shamelessly stole from the imperialism track from Pendragon. So thanks, Morgan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was a breakthrough, actually. Uh, I was thinking, uh, I mean, there's been numerous breakthroughs on Pendragon. Probably the two biggest were, and the latest one was this Imperium track, because originally we had like a linear track, similar to other coin games, um, with the same step but arranged linearly. And it didn't quite capture the, what I wanted. Uh, which was this sort of political game between the two Britain factions, uh, that, that other level of interaction and rivalry. Um, and and the, the terrible thing is that this was kind of actually my original vision and I had strayed away from it, trying to streamline it and I finally came back to it. And I still remember that call to Volko on, the, on Skype one night and I was like, you know, um, you know, I've been worried about that. And I think uh, what we need to do is basically to ditch the world existing Imperium track and bring a new one. And this is obviously months of testing, uh, whatever. And, um, and I explained my concept and Volko was like, okay, yes, it means months of testing, supplemental testing, but I will not let you go back to the first idea. The second idea is so much better. <laughs> so, uh, so that was one. The other, and probably the one which was the frustrating the most at the time was uh, making the, um, well, basically the Kuita test faction work. And, and the first issue was uh, what came to be the wealth. Because originally I had something similar to the warlords in uh, a distant plane 
um, that concept was that basically the Kiritates wanted to keep their money for themselves and not having, you know, pay for soldiers, pay for the defense and etc. So I was measuring directly uh, their degree of success to how much of their resources they were able to hold. Um, and, and it just didn't work. It did sp spawn a number of completely um, uh, ahistorical or, or, or not fun approaches. And it took us a lot of uh, trial and error to finally decorrelate and say, we, we just cannot have something which is directly, because then it would depend on the length of the period and of the epoch, etc. So, <clears throat> so finally we said, you know what, we're going to, these resources mean nothing. You have to transform them into wealth using, you know, various mechanisms and that's wealth which matters. And then wealth again began, took on a lot of new, um, you know, dimensions over time, which, which made the faction actually more and more interesting. Uh, because for a long time, I mean, uh, the Kiritates were, you know, they had a big target painting on them. <laughs> uh, and it was really a try to, you know, try to roll with the, with the times and, and try to keep something from it. Uh, and it wasn't necessarily a lot of fun. So, um, so, so making the Kiritates interesting was, was a challenge, but uh, I think we managed to do it. Uh, I think in Pendragon, for me, the, the, what I remember, and it may seem like a small thing, but it's going from markers to little gold cubes to be prosperity that becomes plunder. That's yours. That's, that's completely yours. Well, uh, yeah. I don't think it's completely mine. Well. Uh, but I think, I think that, was, that was one I remember from development. And uh, I don't know. It it's it's, doesn't exist in any other a game in the series. Yeah, the, the way I recall it, originally I had these markers with different values and um, and you would put the markers on basically on top of the stacks of of, um, of raiders. And you showed me once, uh, you had used these gold cubes taken from some of the game, don't we, can't recall which one it was. And I was like, oh, that's cute, but you know, what's the point? I mean, I was thinking more pieces, more, you know, whatever. And he said, no, but you know, the really neat thing is you can stack them on the Raiders. And we already have that, I think we already had at the time that rule that uh, you could not have more plunder that you had Raiders. And so, so it's visual, you can directly see uh, and associate that. And I, and, and I was like, oh yeah, great. And then it's sort of, and then, but then you had that we we're going to array them as the prosperity value of the region. Oh yeah, that was oh yeah, that was a haha -ha moment, and I, I, it was a purely mathematical. I, I saw that there was a mathematical relationship between the prosperity and the plunder, and um, I, and I had to tweak something a tiny bit, but then we could represent the two with the same pieces. Instead yeah, of was... different, exactly, instead of two different sets of markers that didn't go right. well, longer, we had the same thing, these little gold cubes that look like gold, that look like, you know, yeah. Yeah. prosperity, being carried off by the raiders. As you take it from the province, you put it on the raider, and the arithmetic is done. You're right. Yeah. No, absolutely. I yeah, it's so brilliant and natural for you. You forgot that you, you invented it. <laughs> That's great. Well, hey, let me. Uh, we're 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 coming to a close, so let me close with uh, with one last thought. Um, first of all, thanks to all the designers and everybody for showing up. Um, but I have a, a story. I was driving uh, to meet Mark Herman for a game in L.A., and I get a call, and it's a call from Volko and his son, and they're playing Liberty or Death. Now, um, you know, you can talk about which game is Volko's favorite. But I know that he and Andrew play Liberty or Death a good deal, and that makes me feel really good about 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 uh, the game in his eyes. Um, but uh, Volko's son Andrew beats him like a drum at Liberty or Death. All you know, just and probably at everything else, but certainly at Liberty or Death. So I get this call, and I know if it's if it's Andrew and, and it's hey, Vol this is Volko. Andrew and I have a question. I know it's going to be trouble, right? If they can't figure something out you know there's a serious problem somewhere in the game. So they had found some obscure situation, right? A very, I'm not, I'm not gonna outline it because I don't wanna hear anybody else complain about it. It's a very obscure situation 
that you would never think would happen. And Andrew said, hey, uh, so Harold, if I do this, do I get this? And I said, well, the rules don't address that, frankly. So um, I would say yes, but frankly, we need to, you know, you, you can make a house rule about it. And Volko immediately says, well, I would say no, and we're going to make that a house rule. And I said, Volko, that's not fair. Can we at least vote? And he said, no, it's my house, my rule. So, <laughs> so he implements the rule uh, against poor Andrew. But uh, it was- this I still was, lost. <laughs> <laughs> it was, uh, this was a great opportunity. I love, uh, I love chatting with you all and, and sharing this. And I hope we can do it again sometime. And of course, uh, to the, to the, to the uh, coin father, Volko, thank you for all you do for all of us. Much, much appreciated. And um, that's it. So we'll, uh, we'll be back soon with another Herald on Games.